Hello, I'm Philip Wiley. Thanks for everyone for attending my talk, The Way of the Adversary, Threat Actor Philosophies and Mindsets. I appreciate this opportunity to get to, to present here this year. A little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Philip Wiley. I have my CISSP, OSCP, and SANS GWAPT certifications. Most proud of those is the OSCP. That was a tough uh, process to study for and uh, get certified. The exam was pretty tough, but I learned a lot. When I was getting started as a penetration tester, uh, I'd moved over from application security, got laid off from my job, and went to work as a consultant doing pen testing. I'd run vulnerability scanners and worked in AppSec for several years and security and worked as a sysadmin but I needed to learn how to hack. So I went through the OSCP. So that a, was a really great experience. So I'm very proud to get that. It wasn't easy for me. I had to learn how to hack and that was a, was a really good one for me to learn how to hack. I'm also the, in my career wise, I am the offense, I'm an offensive cybersecurity professional instructor. I have been in offensive security for a little over nine years of my 23 plus years of IT and cybersecurity have a little over 17 years of dedicated cybersecurity experience. I'm an adjunct professor at Dallas College. I teach ethical hacking and web app pen testing. I'm also the Pwn School Project founder. The Pwn School Project was uh, created to give my students a way to further their education. Students down towards the end of the very first semester I taught were asking me, where do I go next? Where do I, where do I go to learn more about this subject? The college didn't offer any more than just the ethical hacking class at the time. Uh, so I decided to, to found the Pwn School Project. It started out mainly being topics on uh, offensive security, but look, with our Denton meetings, uh, Denton, Texas didn't have uh, a security community there. So those meetings tend to be more than just uh, offensive security. We spread into other areas because the goal is to help people get started in security or people in security to advance their careers. So I'm also the concept creator and co-author of the Pentester Blueprint, starting a career as an ethical hacker. Uh, this talk came out of a, a lecture that I used to give my class at the beginning of each semester. Some of the other uh, professors at the college asked me to give the talk to their students. And, you know, first time I gave this presentation was in uh, January 2018, when I was starting out teaching at Dallas College. So from January to to November of that same year of, of 2018, it became a conference talk, and I gave the talk at several conferences. I was featured in the Tribe of Hackers Red Team book, and uh, the publisher, Wiley Publishing, asked me if I'd be interested in writing a book myself, and I thought for a while that the Pentester Blueprint would be a good book to to write about. A lot of other resources teach you how to be a pen tester, teach you pen testing, but no one was really telling you this is what you need to learn before you start. These are some good learning resources to learn pen testing. I'm also the host of the Hacker Factory podcast, and in the spirit of a lot of things I do, uh, it's to help people get started as pen testers. So I have different guests on each episode telling about how they got started in cybersecurity and pen testing and their tips on how to get started. So this is a, in the spirit of the other thing, the other things I do is try to help people and help people get started. And I'm also Innocent Lies Foundation ambassador. The Innocent Lies Foundation helps unmask anonymous child predators. Uh, so they work with volunteers that do OSINT that try to collect this information that they turn over to law enforcement to hopefully apprehend these, these, uh, these people that are uh, harassing children online, these predators. I'm also a hacking is not a crime advocate. And this we're trying to take back what the true meaning of hacker because the media has portrayed it as, uh, you know, we're, as we're all cyber criminals. And so the goal of that is to help the name of the, the hacker. You know, when hacking started out, it was more about people that were actually coding, building things. Uh, you know, some of this came out of the MIT Railroad Club where, you know, people were there working with different technologies and stuff. And that in general, you know, hackers have really been more of uh, makers and, and people that were able to enhance, you know, 
capabilities of product of different products and softwares, different technology. And that's kind of where the hacking turn came about. They were able to hack it or make it do things it wasn't supposed to do and enhance the capabilities. And then, it, you know, over the years, we got to uh, learn the term, you know, it came to be more about, you know, hacking into something, be able to bypass security controls or something like that, finding bugs and systems. But the original term was uh, based on, you know, development. Because you look at the hackathons, hackathons are programming competitions. So these aren't really anything about computer hacking. So so hacking is not a crime. We're just trying to uh, bring awareness to the media and the public because as an, an ethical hacker or a penetration tester, offensive security uh, professional, over the years, people ask me, what do you do for a living? And then it's easier to say ethical hacker than penetration tester because people don't understand it, that term and it takes a little more explanation. When you say ethical hacker, the intent is to make it easier for them to understand. But I've had several people ask me, is there such a thing as an ethical hacker? So, you know, there's a lot of work that we need to do to, to you know, help bring awareness to that and make up for what what the uh, the media has done. So the way of the adversary threat actor philosophies and mindsets, uh, most of your most of your uh, talks and most of your trainings and stuff that you go through in cybersecurity, especially offensive security, so many times we focus on the victims, the targets, the people we're testing. You're focusing on the psychology of those specific targets and sometimes overlooking the psychology and mindset of the adversaries. While understanding the psychology of the victims or the end users, how to successfully social engineer them is very important. But I think to be a really good adversarial uh, professional or, you know, offensive security professional is to understand the psychology of who we're trying to emulate. Uh, so the threat actor philosophy and psychology should be considered. War, war teaches us to know our adversaries. Same thing as in martial arts or other combat sports. In sports in general, know your adversary, know your opponent. Uh, even like football teams will review videos of their opponents prior to the game to, to see how they work. And uh, cyber, cyber professionals, cybersecurity professionals are fighting cyber wars, so we must know our adversaries in that same way. So kind of to get into some of the philosophies and stuff, the conscience of the hacker, also known as the Hacker Manifesto, is a small essay written January 8th, 1986, by a computer security hacker who went by the handle or pseudonym of the mentor, his birth name, Lloyd Blankenship, who belonged to the second generation of the hacker group, Legion of Doom. It was written after the author's arrest and first published in the underground hacker e-zine Frack and can be found on many websites as they tell as as well as on t-shirts and films. Considered a cornerstone of the hacker culture, the manifesto acts as a guideline to hackers across the globe, especially those new to the field. It serves as ethical foundation for hacking and asserts that there is a point of hacking that supersedes selfish desires to exploit harm harm other people and that technology should be used to expand our horizons and help keep the world free. So this this is a, is a good reference here uh, for like the, the philosophy of hackers. And this is more in the mindset of, you know, professional hackers or ethical hackers, people that are trying to do, do this for good. You get into some of the cyber criminals and hacktivists and sometimes they don't always take these things into consideration. Hacktivists sometimes will be not wanting to injure people, but maybe they're, uh, you know, uh, activists towards, you know, uh, climate change in, in the environment. And they'll just want to do things like deface websites or do things to get attention, not harm people. But then again, there's other, there's other types of um, people that use these adversary techniques that, that uh, don't keep this in mind. So they, that this can kind of vary from the type of uh, hacker or adversary. And keep in mind, when we're talking about hacker, we're talking about the when I'm, I'm referring to the skill set, not say, you know, because 
hacker and cyber criminals criminals are not used interchangeably. It's just the tools and techniques that are that are shared. So these the philosophies vary between different types of hackers. For example, some nation states and cyber criminals aren't concerned with the safety and well-being of their targets, which contradict the hacker's manifesto. In some cases, during you know nation states during cyber wars, and you know they're not concerned with the safety of people. Maybe the person doing the action, maybe they are, but the people that they are working for don't consider that. So these philosophies vary. That's why it's really hard to define a philosophy. So if you went to like a, a criminal philosophy compared to just a hacker philosophy, it's gonna be different. But there's gonna be some things that are even uh, similar in uh, all types of hackers, all types of people that, that hack. So, uh, Learning and practicing TTPs, which also you know known as the long-term techniques, tactics, and te techniques, ta tactics, and procedures, help develop the hacker mindset. So developing the hacker mindset is is developed by hands-on practice. So working in labs, working in bug bounties, and doing these things, hands-on hacking is going to help build that mindset. And it's one of those things. Once you've worked as a penetration tester or have done some sort of hacking. You kind of learn that you know you see things. For instance, I was an air, at an airport back during my consulting days, waiting for my luggage at the luggage carousel, and I saw a USB stick laying on the ground. And the first thing I come to mind is I'm thinking of what malicious payload is on that that USB stick, because I know as an adversary emulator, a penetration tester, that a lot of times we deliver payloads that way, and so will adversaries. So will the the bad guys. So when you see those things, you just kind of learn to, th you, you get that hacker mentality. You start to think like a hacker and, you know, you see certain vulnerabilities on a system, you know, you see Apache web server or you see Tomcat and, you know, sometimes they're vulnerable to, uh, to uh, payload uploads and, you know, unrestricted uh, uploads or something like, you know, default credentials. So sometimes, you know, you, you're able to get, a payload to that system and maybe get access. So as you see those things and you develop those hacking skills, learn the different vulnerabilities and exploits, you kind of learn that you know, put those things together. When you see it, you think, okay, this is what I do next. And that, so that's kind of a description of the hacker mindset. The hacker mindset's universal, whether it's used for good or bad, you know, it's the intent that is different. It's not necessarily. So the, the understanding how to get into things piece kind of uh, is universal. So the different adversary types. So we have hacktivist, state actors, cybercrime groups, insiders, scammers, and script kitties. So these are just, you know, there, there could be more groups and this could be broken down further. Uh, your hacktivists are usually just in this because it's for a cause, some ideology. Uh, you know, you could be people that are, that are, you know, for the environment and they may go after some uh, companies or energy companies that are polluting the environment. So they're doing it for a good cause. They're trying, you know, it's just taking activism a step further. You know, one of the things we look at in the digital age, you know, protesting certain things were in person, just some of the old school hack activist type of uh, opportunities and, and ways of doing things have transformed along with, you know, our digital age in the communications. Uh, state actors, this could be any, you know, foreign country, nation states, that this could be their cyber warfare team. This, they're trying to possibly steal intellectual property from other countries. They're trying to disable, you know, power grids or something for other countries uh, in different, you know, enemy states. And you got cyber crime groups, uh, which this can vary the types. Insiders, of course, a lot of times people overlook and there's a higher percentage of people that are insiders and this could be disgruntled employees. And this is not always, you know, an actual employee. This could be a, someone is implanted in the organization. I was speaking with a company last year and they were kind of sharing some uh, intelligence with us and they were talking about a company that, that produced hardware that someone was implanted from another government there to steal intellectual property. 
And so these in, in, insiders can also be disgruntled employees. You hear the stories of past where someone, a programmer for a bank, programmed the application to put like like a tenth of a percent into his account from all the accounts in the bank. And after so long, they got this money. I never verified if that's true or not. It could could well possibly be. Sometimes those stories come from from facts, but I can't validate for sure. But you hear those kind of stories. So you see people that are doing all sorts of things for job security. They want to document things. They don't want people to be able to replace them. So sometimes they do malicious activities. They get you know, upset with their employer. They do things steal intellectual property and all sorts of things. So insiders are also a threat. And so the motivation, and so we, some of these are going to kind of over, you know, kind of overlap with some of the, the with the, uh, the other slide, but hacktivism, financial retaliation, cyber terrorism, curiosity, challenge, and thrills. These are some of the motivations. And these last three, the curiosity and challenge, these are the more of the universal traits, motivations, because a lot of people, whether they're, you know, a malicious threat actor or just someone that does bug bounties or someone that is playing around hack the box, the curiosity and the challenge and the thrill is kind of a motivator. And this is really some of the things that motivate like script kitties. You know, they may find some tool, they're wanting to see if it actually works on a production website and so they try it on a website and so but this the curiosity and challenge and thrills what gets people into hacking in general and so financial one of the things we're seeing with financial you know this could be someone directly breaching a system and getting access to funds or, or things of value and then there's also you know ransomware has been one of the more popular ways that attackers can monetize their attacks so using ransomware, you know, files are encrypted and then the victim has to pay to, you know, get the decryption code keys to be able to decrypt their data. So this is one way attackers have, have uh, found to, to uh, monetize attacks and using cryptocurrency, they're able to get the, the funds without uh, being traced as easily as you would back in the days of someone just doing a wire transfer to a bank or or actually sending money physically or whatever. So these are kind of ways that, that those things have kind of uh, evolved over the years. And so how to start. So getting to know the adversary. So to get to know the adversary, you need to understand their attacks. So one of the ways to start out that is, is kind of a good shortcut to that, because otherwise you can do a lot of studying and, and I advise that too, if you're interested in offensive security, especially more towards the red teaming or adversary emulation, then it's good to study all the different attack techniques and stuff out there. But MITRE has made this more easy for us through the MITRE attack framework. And you can find that at attack.mitre.org. And so they've got like a uh, resource there that you can go through and see these different ATPs and the different TTPs that they're using for their attacks. So this is kind of a way to get to understand you look at these different APTs and see how they're operating. So the cool thing about that is, you know, just from the TTP standpoint, this is something that could go across different APTs, but getting to understand different APTs can be important to your organization. So maybe you you work for a power company or some other resource like natural resource type company, and you can go out and look and find these different APTs and find out what may be the ones that may be attacking your industry more uh, specifically, so that way you kind of know to understand that adversary more. And then cybersecurity threat intelligence. So cyber threat intelligence is uh, is something good to know whenever you're you're trying to learn what these adversaries are doing. So that is a is a good area to to know is knowing your adversary from threat intelligence. And so if you're, you're not familiar with MITRE, uh, MITRE attack is at the address mentioned above, attack.mitre.org. MITRE attack is a globally accessible knowledge base of adversary tactics techniques based on real world observations. The attack knowledge base is used as a foundation for the development of specific threat models and methodologies in the private sector. 
and government and in cybersecurity product and service community. So this is a good way to, you know, you're working on, they mentioned here, your threat model. So you're working on your threat model. You know, there's specific, when you're building out that threat model, uh, you want to take in consideration the adversaries that you may have trying to attack your environment. So that's one of the good ways to know that. So this kind of gives you the, uh, the definition from Miter Attacks website. So using the, 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 so getting more into the cyber threat intelligence, Katie Nichols has some really good stuff out there and she's a SANS instructor and she's also, uh, I believe she works for, I think Canary possibly, I'm not real sure at that. I was looking, preparing any slides, but at any rate, Katie created this, uh, this intelligence training with Adam Pennington. So you can access that on a MITRE's website. So they get some videos and stuff to teach you how to, uh, to learn that threat intelligence. And where I first found out about Katie and the threat intelligence, I follow her on Twitter for years, but where I found out about her threat intelligence involvement was going through looking at some, some material from SANS, some information on, on purple teaming and red teaming. And when they cover some of the stuff on threat intelligence, uh, you know, San, SANS uh, has Katie as an instructor there. So looking at some of the information she had to offer there, some links back to MITRE and some, and also uh, some other resources. So on that resource, there's actually like some videos and stuff too. So that's a, a good resource. And a cyber threat intelligence self-study plan by Katie Nichols. This is on our Medium uh, page. And to date, I believe well, there is just the part one out there, but this is a really good place to start. This shows you some different place, ways to do self-study on threat intelligence. A good low cost. I mean, it doesn't cost you anything. It's free resources. So you can go out there and use this to, to learn about threat intelligence. And also CrowdStrike has some good information out there. Uh, and what is, a, what is cyber threat intelligence by CrowdStrike? So you can find that on their security one-on-one -on -one section on their website. So that's a, that's a good resource there that you can use. And so defending against the adversary. So you, 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 you've learned, you're learning this knowledge of how threat actors work. So you can use this to defend against threat actors. So, you know, this threat intelligence is good for, you know, red teamers to emulate adversaries, but this is also good and very important to the defenders to know what to defend against. You can go out and look at MITRE. You look at the different type of uh, APTs, what TTPs that they're using, and you can go in and make sure you're protecting against those. You know, to watch for those, try to detect and prevent against those type of uh, TTPs. And so for the offensive side, this is kind of the more, the area that's more, that I'm more passionate about, but I wanted to include some of the defense stuff in there too, because uh, in my pen tester blueprint talks in my book, you know, I share with how offensive cybersecurity knowledge is good for defenders. It's good for, for SOC analysts. It's good for network security, operation security, different defenders, not necessarily uh, just the offensive team, but it's good for the defenders to be able to defend against the bad guys. So for offensive security, using the knowledge to emulate threat actors. So you got red teaming. This is true adversary emulation. And I want to make sure to, you know, clarify there is a difference. Uh, red teaming and blue teaming are used to, to generically identify offense and defense. But true red teaming is adversary emulation. Pen testing is using the adversary TTPs during security assessment. So you're performing a security vulnerability assessment. You're using these different TTPs during that test. A pen tester is trying to find every vulnerability that can be exploited and exploiting those. As a red teamer, during a red team operation, you're trying to find high impact vulnerabilities that can be exploited, something that would emulate a breach. So you're finding one or two ways in, having a secondary way in in case you get that first uh option is blocked or something happens, the system gets re rebooted, you can't get back on, having a backup plan, another way to get in. So you're doing things that lead to a bre breach. It's more emulating 
what a threat actor would do, like a nation state or those type of actors. So you're, like I said, you're looking for the things that can be breached. You're going through and trying to, you know, get access, trying to exfil data, see if that's a possibility, see what you could get to. You're trying to go undetected penetration tests. You're, you've got limited time, so you're really not trying to go undetected. You're using vulnerability scanners. Whereas in red teaming, you're not using the vulnerability scanners. You don't want to be caught. You're doing techniques that are there to go undetected. So you keep this in mind. Pen testing, less time. You're trying to find every vulnerability and try to exploit everything that's vulnerable. And purple team is collaborating with the blue team. So red team and blue team working together to try to prevent these type of attacks. And so when it comes to red team operations, you know, plan to execute your, your uh, operation. So you leverage MITRE to emulate adversaries. We got a little screenshot here of what the attack matrix looks like. So you can see there's a risk reconnaissance uh, resource development, initial access, execution, persistence, privilege escalation, defense as defense evasion, credential access, discovery, and lateral movement. And so, you know, also maintaining persistence is one of the things that goes on during this time. So you, you can go through here and pick the APT that you want to use, choose the APT for your engagement, then execute the operation, and then write your report. But also one of the things you can do is you can be more creative. Well, as far as choosing APT, uh, first choice, you might find APTs that are common to your industry and work with those, work on those first. Then later on, you can get more creative and just kind of do your own, come up with your own TTPs and own attack methods. Because, you know, these things before the community knows about it, before MITRE has it in their database, go unknown. So being creative and building your own uh, TTPs is, is a good practice as well. And so pen testing. So you leverage the TTPs during the security assessment. So in this case, you know, you're, you're using whatever, you know, like eternal blue when it was, you, you're still seeing that environment, but that's one of the ones you, that you could try to leverage, see if these vulnerabilities are, are vulnerable to something like that. So you try to see if you can you, you look for your vulnerabilities and see if they can be exploited and then you see how far you, you can go. So you're, you're still leveraging some of the same techniques as an adversary using these TTPs, but you're, you're, you're doing this in a way where you're not worried about going undetected. And to also uh, kind of share, it's good to do pen test and red team engagements both because the red team engage, the blue, the, the uh, pen tests are going to get your security defenses up a little bit quicker. You're doing your regularly reoccurring vulnerability scans. You're doing your pen tests. So red team engagements are more for more mature operate, more mature organizations. So once your organization gets a little more mature, then you don't have to, you know, then you can kind of move on to the uh, adversary emulations of red team engagement. So purple team, as we kind of mentioned a while ago, uh, you're working with the red team Red team and blue team are working together to, to make sure that things are being detected. So going back to, to MITRE, you know, selecting the different APT groups, select specific APTs, seeing if you can run Mimikatz in your environment or if PowerShell is enabled by default. Just going through and working on those, executing Mimikatz. If that executes successfully, then you need to make sure your endpoint protection is detecting and blocking those. And so you work, this is really good to do after a red team engagement or a penetration test, because by going in and shutting down certain tools, then you make it more difficult for attackers to get their attacks through. So this is a great resource and really one of those things when you're starting your pen tests and your vulnerability assessments are running, purple teaming is something to put in there because that helps bring up the maturity of your, your security environment. And so thanks for attending my talk. Uh, before I became an instructor, I was also uh, sharing information with people that wanted to become OSCP certified, wanting to become pen testers. So I've done a lot of mentoring before I started teaching and I do a lot more now mentoring and teaching. So feel free to reach out to me. I'm happy to answer your questions and I'll be answering your questions on the, the DEF CON Discord. But if after the fact or you just want to connect, feel free to connect with me. I'm always big on building my community.
uh, my network of uh, professionals and and so forth. So you see my LinkedIn there, my Twitter, uh, my Hacker Factory podcast can be found on ITSP Magazine. And for all the rest of my links, you can go to my Linktree link there. That's got my Twitch channel. I stream once a week on Twitch. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. And, uh, and so some other social media stuff I share in there. So for the rest of the links, you can go there. So thanks again for attending my talk. And I hope you enjoy the rest of DEF CON. And thanks to Abby and all the Adversary Village volunteers for putting this on. And I hope everyone has a good time. Thanks.